guess I'll call this uh, meeting of the development review board to order. Introduce the members uh, starting on my right. Hi, Jean Leon. Kevin O'Connell. Meredith Crandall, staff. Rob Goodwin, the chair. Chair now, and Vice Chair. Yeah, we're live. Abby White. Thanks. And we have uh, nobody on our uh, Zoom platform this evening. We do have a special guest, uh, Mike Miller. Would you like to introduce yourself real quick? Mike Miller, Planning Director for the City. Wonderful. Uh, our, uh, um, and Joe, have... can you grab your name tag right there? We have Joe Kiernan just joining us. Uh, so I'm sure this will be very brief tonight, but Meredith, we will check the box. I mean, we are talking about rules and procedures. We wouldn't want to skip a beat. All righty. So this is going to be for anybody who is watching our DRB meeting tonight remotely via Orca Media. Um, we don't have any applications on our agenda tonight, but if you still want to log into the meeting, and participate remotely to be able to ask questions, um, then you can join our Zoom meeting. Um, you can type this link into your web browser um, and that will bring you right into the meeting. Um, I will see you want to come in and I'll let you in. Or you can call this phone number and plug in this meeting ID when prompted um, and you'll be able to hear what's going on over your phone as well as ask questions. If you have any problems accessing the meeting, please email me at mcrandall at montpelier-vt.org. I will be monitoring my email um, throughout the meeting. Um, we're going to skip most of this stuff um, because we don't have anybody on remotely. But uh, if somebody does attend, um, log on remotely, please know you're uh, turning on your video is optional. You don't have to do that part. Um, I'll now hand the meeting back over to the chair. All right, thank you, Meredith. Uh, agenda approval. I move to approve the agenda. Second. Motion by Sharon, second by Kevin. Uh, all those in favor of approving the agenda, say aye. 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 Wonderful. The agenda is approved. Um, okay, uh, yeah, so we just wanted to have a quick meeting this evening, maybe like an annual cleanup. I think uh, Meredith and I were just talking, it's been since 2018, since the... Uh, rules of the VRB were updated. A pandemic is thrown in the middle of that. Um, we just wanted to go through and make sure that things still make sense. Um, I don't think we need to take a whole lot of time. We also have Mike here to give an update on the uh, anything that's going on with the planning commission, ask, ask some questions. Um, and so um, I guess with that, um, I'll turn it over to Mike and let you go ahead. Did you skip something? Uh, <laughs> so one of my things was to move the minutes to the end and still always want to do it. Uh, all right, let's, let's look at some minutes here from November 7th. Anyone have any um, revisions or um, comments? Seeing none. Motion for approval. So moved. Motion by Kevin. Second. Second by Abby. All those in favor of approving the minutes for November 7th? Aye. Aye. And it's approved for November 7th. Now you can talk, Mike. <laughs> now, now I can talk. Okay. Um, so Meredith asked uh, that I kind of come in just to give a, a quick update on a little bit of what the Planning Commission is doing, a little bit of what the Planning Commission... Uh, so the Planning Commission is just another... Um, it's kind of the complement body to the development review board, but they handle the policy side. So while you are the quasi-judicial board enforcing and administering the zoning regulation, it is the planning commission's job to, they have two major responsibilities. The first one is to adopt the city plan. And the second is to adopt any zoning regulations that help implement that plan. So any zoning regulations that are passed and any amendments that are passed all have to be consistent with, um, with the uh, city plan. And there's legal requirements in there for both documents. Um, but really that's the, the purview, that's where the 
kind of the two boards here overlap is that they're going to write the rules that you guys are going to be responsible for administering. So as you guys move forward and find things that need uh, clarification or editing or fixing or whatever that comes up, those are things that you could give to Meredith, she'll give them to me, and then the planning commission will consider them or go back and try to make revisions that will improve the process for you. So uh, as you go forward, um, not necessarily in rules of procedure, you guys can do whatever you want with your rules of procedure within the guidelines under the state laws. But uh, if you need changes to chapter four of your regulations, you've got something that's like, boy, this would be easier if we could make this edit. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't, depending on state law. But uh, some things where you do have flexibility, we can go through and make those edits. So uh, that would be kind of a big, uh, kind of a, a big overarching thing between the Planning Commission and the DRB. Right now, what's on the Planning Commission schedule is updating that city plan that we were talking, that I was mentioning. Um, it's been a long time. It's, it was originally kind of adopted. Well, it wasn't kind of adopted. It was adopted in 2009 originally. It's been around since the 1950s. It's been periodically updated. Last major revision was in 2009. We readopted it in 2017 before it went um, and expired because you have to do it every eight years. So we're trying at this point to adopt a new plan. We're doing a comprehensive review. Um, and we're hoping that 2023 is going to be a big year where we're going to be rolling out a number of chapters um, and get hopefully approval by the end of 2023. That would be a really big accomplishment if we can get it done next year. Um, a lot of that has to do with how long it takes to get through the public process. And that takes as long as it's going to take, um, which anyone who did knew the zoning provisions knows that that took a long time. Um, the city plan update can also probably take a long time. So we'll see how that goes. But those are the big things that we're working on. We usually do one, sometimes two zoning updates a year while we're doing these other things, we'll squeeze them in. So um, we haven't done one since March maybe. So if there is a set of revisions, we Meredith and I have a little running list. We haven't seen anything that's come up to really push us to get that next round of amendments going but um if things come up we'll get another set queued up um so when you uh when you do that revision do we get it like is there an addition to our book is there oh of the reg changes yeah. oh yeah every time we issue new regulations we circulate all those around okay. um and you know we usually i try and give previews when we know what sections we're working on next um and and when that process gets going um so yes no you will get we like you said we, there hasn't been a big stumbling block issue in the last several months so we've been able to focus on other things there there are some provisions we know we need to um work on but there are either either things that it's not a major priority or we have to wait for other issues to resolve before we can really dig into what we're going to make for changes. Is there a kind of a theme as to the kinds of things that you're finding that that pop up as something that's work that's worthy of consideration for for revising for zoning revisions? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Uh, usually they they a lot of them are technical. They'll come up as Meredith or Audra are actually enforcing the rules and they'll say there's, you know, we've got an inconsistency or it's clearly, you know, A, B, and C are being talked about, but it never really considered D. Mm -hmm. And we have a D application and what do we do? It doesn't fit into this other box. So we need to make a revision. So a lot of them are those types of things that we didn't. Some of them, when the big zoning, so the, our major zoning went through in 2018 right. and that was after seven years of work. Um, even when that passed, we knew in the office, there were a number of chapters that needed work and that included, and then they're still in need of work. We still know the sign regulations need work. We still know the subdivision regulations need work, but at the time we're working with a consultant We're we're getting things done. We got things to a point where, um, you know, don't let perfect be the enemy of the good and we passed what we had and then knew we would go back for some regular um, some changes. So we know there's some in there that could be better. 
you know, in particular, the sign ordinance would be much better, could be much better. Um, the subdivision regulations that are in there are a little more, I would call them suburban mm. than they are urban. Um, they're, they're really kind of set up for a different type of community. So I think I, a little bit more new development versus uh, infill or yeah, it's, whatnot too. Yeah, it's really so. set up for, oh, so when you're going in there with your 20 acres and you're going to subdivide it into 80 lots, yeah. this is uh, how you would do it. And we're kind of like, we haven't had that in decades. I don't know if we'll have that except for maybe Elks Club. And even that won't be that big uh, for yeah. subdivision, but that's the, the type of things. It really needs to be more focused towards a more urban environment. Yeah. And so, you know, we, those of us who've gone through all that, we've found workarounds, we've found ways to make it work, but we'd like to clean it up. Um, and that's, you know, the, with the big, oh, this doesn't work shortly after I got hired, we did the whole, oh, right. Steep slopes. <laughs> Yeah. We can't ban all construction on steep slopes in the mountainous river valley. So that's we had a big deal. That's a, big deal. That yeah. was a really big deal. So we've we've tried to deal with those kinds of, you know, issues where it just put massive breaks on projects that really shouldn't have had them. Yeah. Um, and now we're we're dealing with a little bit more of the finesse issues. So I guess, yeah, one thing that does seem like over the last few years, we've been sort of trying to address some of these technical issues in a piecemeal fashion. And, you know, I think that like maybe more generally, and I'm kind of interested in input from board members on that, is that it seems like we often get into situations where our hands are tied and then it's so clear in the regs that like, you know, mayor has no discretion to do anything different. Like we, as a board have no discretion to do anything different. It says what it says. And like, we end up ha having to make a decision at which, maybe we're not happy with, but it's what the regs say that we're supposed, you know, supposed to do. And that it, it just seems like there should be a process at which this board can take, you know, any legitimate application uh, at, fa at face value and look at the facts and make it, you know, make, make a decision as to like how to get around a, um, Oh, I don't know. I'm going to give a fictitious, uh, you know, example, uh, say the regs say that uh, you can not develop if the slopes are above 11%, but they show 10%, you know, it's like this board should be able to sort of make a discretionary decision as to like clearly in the regs that like, oh, obviously like the intent here was something different. I just feel like there's a lot of instances where we don't necessarily have that latitude because it spells out specific members, numbers and metrics. And I mean, I would, I would, I just would, how would you decide where that line was, though, on what where our discretion goes? I mean, I think that that's that's a yeah, that's a good question. That's a good question, but I think that in many ways, like there are a lot of resources go into us having meetings and us being a, a board of seven and us having having a quorum and like you know review of evidence um, and comment by the public, and that there's a big process there, and so that like um, I think that by going through that process in many ways you can afford us to have a little bit more leeway into taking a application where they're hung or hung up on like a specific number, a specific me metric and to be able to get around it. Cause I, I don't know, these regs are like 250 pages or whatever, you know, long, like we're never going to like fix every single, you know, sentence to like be able to spell out every single, every single scenario. And I think you can set the bar pretty high for like when we go down the road of using our discretion. I mean, if you do that, but sometimes I feel like sometimes it's a dead end and we don't have anywhere to go. <laughs> yeah, we've tried as we run into these, we certainly try to go through and put make things more flexible where the that ability exists. Um think of like the the waiver for footprint size. There's a footprint requirement that says, you know, maximum footprint for this neighborhood is two thousand five hundred square feet. But you can get a waiver the DRB can issue, and it can it, it's an unlimited waiver. You can get a waiver up to any size, and the conditions are it has to can't impact the character of the neighborhood. So then you guys can make that determination, and so those are good. And as we've gone through and kind of tackled these, and a little bit of this comes down to having a set of regulations that were, um, it, it's kind of like writing. Uh, writing uh, a, a story or something by committee. Uh, and the same thing happens in writing zoning. It isn't written by one person. 
you know, it's a consultant, it's been amended by the planning commission, it's then been further amended by city council. And so things kind of get jumbled in and not everything works together. And in certain cases, as I said, with the 2018, we knew looking at it in 2018, that's not the way I would do it. Mm -hmm. But we've been working on this for seven years and we need to get this across the finish line and then go back afterwards and make the repairs. And some of these were things we could foresee. We were like, it's going to be unlikely that happens and it happens. And we're like, all right, well, now we're going to have to deal with it. But that gives me the excuse to go back to the planning commission and say, you know, we knew we recognized this was possibility. Now it's here. We've got to, we've got to deal with it. But I think the revisions we've been making have in general been pretty good. We haven't, we haven't had too many of the revisions that we've gone through where we've gotten done with it and said, nope, we got to go back and right. revise the revision. So I think it's, it's going to take some time. The pieces we've gone through, we've been very deliberate and careful to really add more text to think about it, make it more flexible um, All right. as best we can. And again, we talk about it at, at, a, at a big level as well of, what can we move down and make it administrative so that way it doesn't come to you at all? I mean, there's sometimes you guys get applications where it's kind of like, yes, what is, yeah. what do we, yes. what's everybody doing here? <laughs> this is, this is so obvious. There's no reason for it to be here. And those are the yeah. ones that we're trying to, to move. And for folks who haven't been here, um, back in, uh, 2017, there were, uh, the city issued 146 building permits, or uh, zoning permits, uh, and 72 of them went to the DRB and 74 of them were administrative permits. And last year, there were about 140 permits issued and only 22 of them went to you. Mm -hmm. So we've vastly pulled things back and made them administrative. So we've, we've certainly cleaned up that portion of it, but there's still some things that get through that we're like, mm. yep, this has to go, um, you know, the which actually didn't need a permit at all. The, the, the yeah. um, cliff street for the, the <laughs> just that, that one driveway temporary access going up a hill, it's going to impact a 30% slope. And we're all like, ah, oh. I mean, that one turned into its own thing, but, um, but again, you get these small permits, small projects that eventually you kind of, we, we try to work ways out where we can make the process better for everybody. Absolutely. Rob, did you have a specific areas where you thought that in particular? Well, I think that that, that application uh, Mike just spoke <laughs> of uh, with steep slopes was, was, you know, was particular. I mean, I think that like uh, fences are maybe another area where we don't have a whole lot of leeway in how those are, you know, done. Um, not to say that I think that everyone should be able to put a 10 foot tall fence in front of their house. However, uh, I don't, I don't see a reason why the board should be prohibited in a certain instance um, with a, nice application that's has good you know good merits from um issuing some sort of waiver that's that's greater than what's afforded in the, in the, in the regulations so so, there are some waivers for that in there they're very specific but i think it was like 10 percent like 10 percent of the height or something like that uh that's for your standard one if there, there's other specific conditions where like you're on the highway or you have a situation where you're on a slope right and you're dealing with a slope it's sure where they do allow the higher fences but yeah, I mean, that was one. If you have specific things that you think would make the regs better I mean, I or think, you want that yeah. percentage height to be different, those are things that we can always investigate and yeah. push forward to the planning commission. Like if anybody, any members of the board are like, this really doesn't make sense. I'd like to see something different. As individuals, you can put that forward, you know, or as a board as a whole, talk about it. Those are always options. Mm -hmm. I guess uh, I don't know. Just, just, just to speak freely, you know, as the chair, I would be in favor of a, of a general waiver with some rigorous criteria for the board to evaluate. If we got into a a, a unique situation um, that we could fall back on, and yeah, it would be some rigorous criteria. But I think it would avoid us from having to sort of like uh, I don't know, be obtuse in a situation uh, where the planning commission came up with some you know information that. Uh, or some rules that, uh, you know, it's a situation that couldn't be anticipated. Uh, and I feel like sometimes we don't have that flexibility. Mm -hmm. well, what, what are you thinking? What would be an example of, of that? I mean, just mm -hmm. hypothetical objects. 
Um, well, I think uh, an example of a fence is, it, 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 you know, is perfect. Uh, someone, uh, you know, comes in and wants to build a four foot fence with a uh, vegetated uh, trellis on top of it um, in a very, uh, you know, like a sort of a pace place of town that maybe needs some uh, greenery and needs some, you know, sort of streetscaping and improvement. Uh, and, it, you know, it's it's a great addition to the community, but we're not allowed to prove it because, uh, you know, the fence is going to be over the height. Uh, at which uh, is allowed specifically in the reds and like we can't uh, issue issue a waiver. I mean, that's just one, but I think my point is, is that like, I don't know what the specific things, if we knew what the specific thing was, we would write the regs to account for the specific thing. Uh, and I feel like our job as the board is to, is to sit here and to be able to like address those issues where there's irregularity and there are issues that couldn't right, be right. I, 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 I totally agree with that, but I have yet to see a zoning board have a, universal waiver uh, authority. And that's also, just as a note, yep. when we get those kinds of applications, sure. a lot of the time we filter them out on our end and sometimes we go, well, yeah, that makes sense. And so that becomes part of the next round of zoning regulations mm -hmm. changes where we tweak it. If it's something that really makes absolute sense to have allowed, mm -hmm. we've, I mean, we've done some things like that where people just held up their projects until we changed the zoning regulations. Sure. I mean, I guess so. I wouldn't call that process necessarily a very, uh, you know, efficient process, you know, process. But it's also, you know, the way I, when you're talking about specific numbers, mm -hmm. speaking from a, a, supporting the decision point of view, if you start just throwing in sort of more amorphous waiver criteria, mm -hmm. you start getting decisions that are not supported by the regs, which are what your authority are, and make them more appealable. Mm -hmm. Because that's, they that's say you're, you're exercising yeah. too broad of a discretion, mm -hmm. sure. right? Sure. So mm -hmm. just throwing that out there. Oh, yeah. I think it's a valid <laughs> point. Yeah, I kind of feel like in a lot of circumstances, Numbers are difficult to get around, but a lot of times the language, you can finesse it a little bit and it gets to the yeah. point where if somebody were to appeal it, they probably win. And so then it's really almost like a general waiver of sorts where you just kind of throw it out there and you see if anyone cares. And usually nobody cares. Like the, that overhang over those dumpsters for the little old ladies. You know, like, I don't think we really <laughs> followed the letter of the law on that one at all. Sure. We just kind of took it upon ourselves to say, this makes sense for them to build this thing. So we're just going to build it and we're going to see if anyone's big enough jerk to say something about it. And no one did, right? Now it's built. And so that was an instance where we kind of just kind of, you know, finessed our language a little bit. Because if I remember correctly, they were not allowed to build that thing according to like the letter of the law. And we just let them build it. And I, the real key is that there's an appeal process and that's what like gives it a mandate, you know, like it went out there, it went up on, you know, online, anyone could have seen it, anyone could have complained and they would have been legally able to do so, but no one cared. So it slipped through the cracks and here we are now, they are covering over their dumpster. So it was a fence, right? Was on, there's was some thing, yeah. some yeah. reason was, they couldn't do it. Like, it was too close to the road or thing. something, I forget yeah. what it was, but it was, it, yeah, be converting the fence to a other kind of structure. Yeah. Right. <laughs> what is it really? It was really, yeah, I mean, it was, it was silly, basically. Yeah. Sure. Exactly. Uh, yes. Oh, it's uh, uh, no, North Franklin. Uh, North Franklin. Yeah. So I, I get your point with like when it's numbers, those are hard to get around. Like you can't build a building that's taller than 35 feet. Someone wants to build a 30 foot and a half foot tall building. You know? Although there are like 10% waivers in there, you know, the numbers can be difficult to get around, but at the same time, it kind of gives us an out also sometimes, you know, like the mm -hmm. last meeting we had where everyone showed up to try and complain about that well apartment building they want to build. And, you know, the regs give us a reason to tell them all, sorry, there's nothing we can do, you know, because we aren't really, we don't, really don't have that much power. Like we really <laughs> just kind of sit here and take it when the public wants to <laughs> yell at somebody. And they get on the chin, Joe. Yeah. Uh, the the uh, PUD. Yeah, the PUD. Yep, the PUD where they want to build the five units in the yeah. existing barn. And yeah, there are a lot of aspects of this job that are kind of 
frustrating. Like, well, especially the part like I want to give these people a lot of suggestions sometimes, and like that is just not no, in our scope of no, work. It's like not. we cannot do that. And no, like I, I want to tell them like there's a way you could do this, you know, but yeah. be like this, you know, no, this <laughs> we can't do that. We really do just have to. A lot of times, I mean, ninety percent of our work is done by Meredith and the staff. Ninety five percent, yeah, most weeks ninety nine percent. We're, you know. <laughs> we're very rare. we're very fortunate here in Montpelier to have uh, that asset. Yes. We very yes. rarely get an opportunity to actually do anything. Really. <laughs> so, so true. Um, and me, and that's probably you know ultimately a good thing because one day we'll all be dead and gone, but the planning commission DRB will still be here, you know. And you don't know who's going to end up on these boards. They get appointed, and true. And you don't want like some guy who's got a buddy like, oh, if I got on the DRB because I know the mayor, you know, I get appointed, and we could we could make this happen, you know, because there's this variance, this general waiver, they just. You know, it's right now it's fine to have something like that, but it's not written for just today. You know, it's written for trying to foresee into the future, you know, forever, which is impossible, which is why it keeps on getting rewritten. But yeah, I get what you're saying. I do wish sometimes people could just say like, oh, well, let me bring it before the board and see what they think, you know, but I don't, I don't know if it's really feasible to do that. I just don't, don't see it really. And I do think that we have a lot of leeway when we want to, but the ultimate check is the public. They get to complain. And if they have a valid complaint, then we're kind of kind of in trouble, I think. Especially when they bring in lawyers and stuff. It's, it's pretty intimidating. Someone has yeah, probably the biggest place you have power is when, you, when you're looking at a project that has something that, that has as a requirement the character of the area. That's probably the area that, um, I mean, you're, you guys are the, the board of reasonable persons. So we Meredith deals with objective standards. You guys deal with sub subjective standards. Most of yeah. what you should be looking at are subjective. Um, and it's hopeful that the rules have been written with enough guidance that everybody kind of uniformly says, yeah, that's, that yeah. meets it, that meets it, that meets it. And where you've got the most discretion is when it comes down to something as vague as the character yeah. of the area. Yeah. And it, it is a vague term. But it's a term of art. There's a lot of legal things, and Meredith can get into it as you as you debate those. But that's where you've got the most flexibility. And that's where we can really give the least advice from staff standpoint. It's what the public and the applicant and you interpret as what is the character of that neighborhood. How do I define that neighborhood? Is it just that street? Because some neighborhoods in the zoning are quite big. I mean, you look at the Wrightsville neighborhood is everything north of um North the nature Spring. center yeah, right. mm -hmm. so that's that's a huge huge area what's what's the character of that area you know in some places there's little little places where lots of small houses are together there's some places that are you know out by themselves on 50 acres so what's the character and i think that's when when it comes to you guys it's like all right well we've got a proposal here it might be okay on this property in this instance but in the same neighborhood it's not okay in this parcel and that's part of kind of what go, what goes in for that character of the neighborhood Does anyone have any more questions for mike um and, yeah just one uh, kind of procedural question i know that periodically uh in meetings and they're not big things but it, that there's it's all sort of go oh what yeah and it's like no that's going to change i i have the sense that you're keeping track of those meredith yeah that when you, when you get that <laughs> that comes up that you Keep track of that and it goes to Mike in some fashion or another. Yep. No, that's my my regulation book is marked up with all sorts of things. <laughs> all the little things and the big things, and then big things get reported to Mike. And then as we go along, when we go to the next round of of changes, we usually look at our books together and make sure we've grabbed everything we can. Yeah. I guess the only other thing is that um is that maybe we could do sort of the same thing, Rob, where, where places where you feel like this is a place where we would have had, we should have some room, you know, and yeah. we don't right now, we could say like, can you look at this and figure out how to give us a little bit of wiggle room here? Because this is ridiculous. You know, I mean, like keep track of that and then yeah. maybe we could shift it that way. Yeah. And there are times the planning commission has tried and it hasn't gotten past the city council too. So there are different. I'm sorry. I different times. Times that the um, planning commission does things and it doesn't get through city council. So um, it's not always, um, you know, that, that, that it goes through. Um, most notably, the one was the the uh, shading criteria. 
um, which was an issue for. Um, it came up over on Ewing Street. Ewing Street. Um, with the solar shading criteria and how you measure that and yeah, you know, the whole like specific dates when you have to look at whether or not you're shading the neighboring building. So they we, tried, we to tried to remove it and city council kept it back in. So, so it's still there. Hmm. So we, we, it's we keep village. looking at things <laughs> and we'll see, um, we'll see where that, where that goes. But again, any of these changes, you're always welcome to, to let Meredith know and I can work on them. Yeah. Um, we don't have anything, like I said, queued up at this point, but we'll probably look at something in the in the winter months, a little bit more time. Hopefully that demolition provision. Uh, demolition provision could be one. Demolition signs are two of our biggies. What's the demolition one? Uh, especially in demolition, the whole how you determine whether or not uh, you can demolish part of or an entire historic structure. That part is and how you guys evaluate that. That one needs to be reworked. It's kind of a mess. Every time it's come before you guys, it's it's been mm -hmm. a difficult yeah. one to, to yeah. parse out and figure out what's I agree. what's the appropriate information to have from the applicant. Yep. And um exactly how you weigh that information under the criteria. Um it's not not very clear. We've got to dig into that one. I guess one area we see a lot of where I think it's, uh, you know, like driveway spacing is in the regs and we see a number of applications on that. And it's really, I think the board has generally concluded it's really a public works opinion as to like whether it's, uh, you know, sufficient or not. You know, I don't know that, uh, you know, those things, sometimes we get applications here that are specifically related to that. And, and I think that that's something that, I don't know. Maybe we could spare the applicant of if there's a way around it. Maybe there's not. I don't know. But adding it to the list. Yeah, it depends where, where it is um, in the regs. There's certain things under state law that have to go to the board, but we do try as much as we can. If there is a requirement, like in, in, if something's part of a subdivision, it has to go to you guys for approval. Sure. So as much as possible, we try to go through and make the requirement be, has to be has to be uh, approved by the yeah. by the yeah. DPW chair and or a, D, a DPW director, so that way. Yeah, it's the two driveways or driveway less than the minimum spacing that we have. Um, and I think I don't know if that's something that could be administrative yeah. with DPW well, approval or not. That would we'd have to look in the statutes. I guess you're you're onto it. We talked about it earlier, and it's like this. So a separation between uh, existing development and proposed development, and the regs doesn't necessarily do a very good job of like uh, making those very separate from each other. <laughs> uh, you know, versus like, oh, if you're going to do a subdivision, the driveway spacing has to be X amount, and this many drives, and this many you know trees. But if you're going to like go redevelop, uh, say St. Paul Street, where the lot lines aren't going to change, you know, nothing's going to change. The driveways like really aren't going to, you know, aren't, aren't going to change. Um, that's just like a whole. It should be a whole different, you know. Yeah, a couple and, of and, transportation, and, and yeah. you know, we mentioned the subdivisions being kind of a little bit more suburban. Um, some of the transportation standards that were in there did kind of fall into that as well, and that's you know, these access. Yeah, you know, obviously it's easy to have driveway separations when everybody's on a quarter acre lot, but sure, we actually have most of our downtown are on much smaller yeah. than you know, quarter. Like you know, you know, and start yeah. hitting quarter acre lots until you're up on Town Hill. I mean, everybody who's down in Liberty, Loomis, St. Paul, all the way down to Barry Street, those are all 3,000, sure. some of them down to, we have, you know, 1,500, 1,800 square foot lots um, in different areas. So right. street then, street. Then, then you've got, then you have to have 15 foot or 20 foot separation between driveways. And you're like, what am I going to do? Drive yeah, right I mean, into the center of my house? Yeah, <laughs> street trees is another one of the category where it's like, well, maybe there's, maybe it's not that street trees are not important for these existing neighborhoods. And they absolutely are. But it's like, the re I think that it, the regs for, for a new development bleed into like the existing development on that concept too. And it, it can be a bit difficult to decipher. So I think a theme throughout the entire document. 
Yeah. So we hit the yeah we hit the for existing downtown stuff we hit the street tree criteria as an issue both for the uh, parking garage and for the Gary residence addition where we had to look at we had to use its judgment on well what do we do with these trees that are already existing but don't necessarily meet the criteria and we know they're going to have to tear things up so how do we you know how do they they deal with that street tree requirement so maybe it was the attempt planning commission that any new development uh you know left of a braid of grass uh, <laughs> is going to require street siege along you know main street like maybe that's the case but it doesn't appear very clear and i don't think that that's what was intended <laughs> Good here. Okay. Well, Thank have you. Good night. Thank Thanks, you. Mike. <clears throat> um, all right. So, Meredith, were there any key sections which you thought would be important for us um, to just sort of like go over real quick? We don't need to go through the whole document, I don't think. Um, um, I know you have some notes on procedural stuff with whether it makes sense, but yeah, I had when I went through just on my own, there are a few little things that I know have come up um, here in the board as we've, especially over the last few years, as we have dealt with with things and absences, um, that I think it makes sense to maybe try and do a revision of the rules of procedure, um, specifically making sure that there is a um, it, that it clearly states in here that the board has the authority to um, nominate and and um, appoint a acting chair when neither the chair nor the vice chair are either available or you know are conflicted out of an application. That we have that in here clearly. It's right now in the rules of procedure that only appears with the conflicted out. And that's sort of buried in the rules. You don't have that option just because, you know, people are out of the country or somebody's away um, or are sick, right? I think that should be something that's in here. Um, there are a few little that's things. Right. That's actually for a vice chair, right? If the chair and the vice chair are both out, then they temporarily elect a vice chair, not a chair. Um, in what I read. here, I think it's called an acting chair. You can just say an acting chair. Right. Um, it's a vice chair. I was, I didn't know that. I thought it was a weird pick one. And, and yeah. with it. I don't think, I don't think that we, um, I could, you know, I can double check into the statute. What, if anywhere it specifies that, um, and if there's one term or the other, but something along those lines, um, I think should be in here. Um, there were some other tweaks that were a little strange where, um, so some of the board's decisions pre-2018 were actually made in the minutes. That was the only written expression of the decisions. And so these rules of procedure actually say that the DRB's minutes are recorded in the city clerk's office, not just the decisions. That, that hasn't been done since before I got that's here. So that's not true. That doesn't happen. <laughs> yes. um, so I think that should be tweaked. Um, we also have this in the order of business section, report on administrative approvals and report on actions taken in prior deliberative sessions. I don't think those are things that we have to have in there. I think those are things that used to happen by the board. And so keeping that in here in the order of business doesn't really make sense unless the board really wants it. Um, and doing a report on administrative approvals every meeting would be pretty long. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, yeah. It's, uh, is, is available. I guess there's not a concrete list that's available, but Aud we have a system that exists. Yep. Audra can, uh, we generate that report every year for the annual report. Um, so Audra has that information available from our database and somebody requests it for the administrative approvals. Um, and you know, reports on deliberative sessions, those are always those have already that's already in a written decision. So I, I think that those could be struck. Um, you know, the the key, I think the it's some of the key provisions in here that we don't necessarily work with every day um, are the whole 
it's not very well spelled out, but there's one paragraph on conflict of interest that just goes back to the ethics policy. The ethics policy is rolled into the open meetings um, document that is part of the guidance packet that everybody got. Um, it's pretty you know, basic stuff. If you know you have a conflict that involves financial or other gain, you're supposed to recuse yourself. If there's something that's the appearance, you have to at the very least disclose it yeah. um, during the public hearing process and give people the opportunity to object to you taking you know taking part. Um, that's the real basics. There's there's more involved there, and you know the ex parte communications part. That's one of those things where. I think the easiest thing to do if somebody's trying to talk to you about either an application that you know is coming or a project where you're like, hmm, that project could come before the board, either as something that will come before the board as a first instance, or pretty sure that's going to need a zoning permit. So technically it could get appealed to the board. Just be like, hey, I'm on the DRB. I really can't talk about this. If you have questions or you know you want to know what's going on, Contact the planning department, contact Andra, contact, you know, contact Meredith, but probably you want me to be on the board if this comes before me. So don't talk to me because if you do, I might have to recuse myself. Like, I mean, we, Catherine and I were talking about it at one point and I think, you know, that, I mean, I feel comfortable talking to people about procedures, yeah, but mm -hmm. nothing project specific. Yep. And that uh, if people say so about that, I'm like, if you need information about the project, uh, call the planning office. Progress. Yeah. It's okay. Thanks. Yeah, and that and that works people that works well, Sharon. Really just right. re referring yeah. people to the office. Yeah. Or if their question might just be, you know, is this on the schedule? Something yeah. that, that's simple and easy. Right. In which case you can answer that. Right. But yeah. you, you know, don't want to get into that of this details. Yeah. No. And uh, yeah. That, you know, I'm thinking about the time I've been on the board, but how, how often that's come up as an issue. It, it comes up relatively frequently, but it's usually just, hey, do you know when this is going to be heard? Mm -hmm. Something really basic. Mm -hmm. um, can I ask a, this is kind of a silly question maybe, but I'm not aware of the, who our secretary is. Do we even have one? I saw that that's, too. <laughs> that, is that you? That's yeah. me. That's the, that's the planning department. So it's sort of a combined thing or recording. We have a recording secretary um, who she used to attend. Um, so you meetings, do all the minutes. But I, I review oh. them. So okay. we have a recording secretary who listens to every single right. meeting. Wow, it all, it's, I mean, I think it's okay. Yeah, Cause it's, yeah, I mean, Sorry. we can, I, I'll try and log it back in. Um, so does that mean our whole Orca Media thing went down to or streaming? It's so yeah. weird because the Zoom on mine that's running it is it's working. Crazy that it crashed on that computer that was not even posted on that computer. Oh, this one is so the center. Yeah, the center one. So give me just a second um, just to see if I can get that up and running. Um, so, yeah, we have a recording secretary. She listens to the audio, to, to the video of every single meeting um, and types up the minutes, and then I review those minutes. Okay. Almost 99% of the time, every once in a while, I'm out or whatever, and we just need to get them posted. But I review those um, and make edits. And then, um, what? Just, okay. All right. Interesting. It's Google. <laughs> Maybe. Um, Honestly, I, I I don't have I don't have the bandwidth to type out every single meeting minutes. <laughs> of course you don't. I do them for one of my committees, but not this one or design review. All right, let me see if I can load this back in. Pretty slow. All right. Yeah, it's just council chambers that. Or are you is yours not in either? No, I'm in. Okay. Recording in progress. Yeah, yeah something happened with that laptop. It wanted to do an update earlier and I told it to wait for like 720 minutes or whatever. So maybe that's the problem that it's trying to do the update still. Thank you. We're back. Okay. You're back online.
so yeah that wasn't a, okay it wasn't a silly question it is a weird thing in here but the yeah the za and the department of planning have basically been nominated as secretary um and yeah okay for it's just funny because it's like they they're written as different roles but they're actually um, we could maybe potentially uh reword that a little bit to maybe better reflect. if they're ever going to be separate roles again then it's probably fine but yeah, secretary who may or may not be a member of the board and may be designated as the Department of Planning and Community Development. So, yeah, I mean, the, the zoning administrator has a very specific role. True. Sure. And then the, the secretary part, if for some reason we lost our, the person that we contract out to to do the minutes, the planning department as a whole would be need to do that. So it could be like the zoning assistant, somebody else, you know, or if, if we had, you know, a, actually had an administrative assistant planning department, which we don't, um, you know, they could come in and, and do those minutes and it wouldn't necessarily have to be the zoning yeah. administrator yeah. with the okay. way it's written. Well, some of the other uh, comments. Want to move the minutes? Is that what you said? Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah I was going to get to that. I just, I, I feel like we did it one meeting and, uh, it, it's it actually, I think it makes it flow a little better in the sense that we just end the meeting and then we sort of like say thank you and then we do adjourn. I think that like having it at the end works and then the, the applicants don't have to sit through us the minutes and the chair doesn't have to forget um, <laughs> bringing up the minutes. <laughs> we, that's and that's, yeah, that's not a, I don't know, that's not an important thing. Procedure of what the order should be. Um, I do think we should get, yeah. It was, you have people that are coming in for these meetings and they don't want to yeah. sit here and listen to us approve yeah. the minutes, even though it only takes like a literally a minute, not even yeah. just get the we minute out as soon as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Um move that above other business. So then I just did have one note here, and it's interesting that um so there's like a general thing on like the oaths here, and it's mm -hmm. almost like during sketch plan, it might make it clear that like that's not necessary. Uh, but maybe we don't do that because it's not that like every single person that speaks before the. I don't know. Maybe I'm a, maybe I'm wrong on that. Because yeah, it specifies testimony by witnesses, oh, okay. right? Mike wasn't a witness giving testimony, so sure. we didn't have to give him an oath. Yep. Sketch plan. There's no official testimony. Right. So, sure. I mean, we could, but no. makes sense. Do uh, do attorneys have to swear in? Oh boy, I don't think so. Not historically, um, anyway. Not historically, not according to any attorney that's been here before the board in the last four years. <laughs> so All right, then. Well, it goes back a lot for a long experience. <laughs> the, yeah, because they are there representing their client, so they are not a witness. No, that's right. Right. They're, so, but that's the that's the line. Whereas if they start bleeding over and it starts being like, mm, can your client actually do that? Because they're start, you're starting to bleed into testimony mm -hmm. right if it seems like the lawyer starting to bleed into testimony it really so, could be someone else giving every, that information we have every right to remind them they are not testifying so yeah <laughs> yep. we did the building that didn't happen in front of the thrush <laughs> we feel like it was like, attorneys the other one though uh was uh the liberty street yeah that attorney was trying yeah. to testify what? did that ever get which one? Oh, i don't know oh 14 no. liberty street yeah. that's still before the environmental court hmm. that's actually because that's an appeal of the de demolition provision right yeah. that's part of what we're waiting for before we do any digging any more work on revisions to the demolition provision hmm. Um, we actually have a revision, a draft revision from the director of the Historic Preservation Department at UVM, who's on the HPC, Montpelier's uh, Historic Preservation Commission, but which like, we're not even going to touch it until we find out what the yeah. court says about the provision that we've already got. Hmm. All right. So, so if you did come up here and lie while under oath, is there any consequences there? Pains and penalties of perjury. <laughs> yeah, I, I have no idea who would enforce that other than that it could make the permit void if yeah. it was in in support of a permit that was then granted. Um, you know, and that's the 
applicants who attest to things in their application. Right. Um, you know, which anything here would be part of that and part of the decision, that's what they're bound by. And if they lied and then they don't do it or they didn't do it. Okay. They could be a civil action. They, they could be a civil action and as well as just the, well, your permits void. void. Right. You know, the, the permit could be void, but they can appeal it. And then that would be the civic part. Yeah. I'm it's thinking. Yeah. Or, and somebody else could potentially appeal yes. it yes especially you know that might void the timeline too i don't know i think probably most likely a topic that would be battled in environmental <laughs> court on appeal uh <laughs> and it would be part of the uh decision uh, as to like whether someone perjured themselves or not yeah um and if it's not already there it would then become part of the notes in the statutory books oh mm -hmm. uh, yeah all right mm -hmm. i think that's good. Um, I guess Meredith had talked briefly about there's nothing in here yet about like sort of the hybrid format digital like meeting materials, oh. uh, the um, remote meeting procedures. Um, and Meredith mentioned that the legislature is going to take this up this session generally in Vermont. Hopefully. Hopefully. Um, but I think if we do sort of make some revisions here, we might want to think of some very basic things that don't even apply to that, that we might want included. Um, and, or just provide some like maybe clarity to in a written extra document that's not part of our rules as to like what our preference is, as opposed to like, uh, you know, so that maybe like a, they hire a consultant. I think we want, like it when people hire consultants, they like do good work, but we don't want to make the consultant drive all the way here and spend like three hours of their day and our applicant pay them so that I think that that's always permissible for someone to be you know, on online. Um, but on the other hand, uh, I don't know, just being the chair, I wouldn't, I would prefer if we had a very controversial with a hundred plus people commenting um, to not necessarily have it an option for everybody to be commenting on the platform. But also not limited to those with accessibility issues uh, and, you know, good reason for not being able to attend, you know, in person. And so like, that's, a, I think a difficult uh, area to, to, to navigate, but I think the reality of it is, is that uh, for these public hearings, like if people are in person and making comments, it's much more productive than it is 100%. with the Zoom platform. So. I, I'm, I'm totally in support of that, Rob. But but it's going to be it's going to be like herding cats in the legislature when they try to figure out how to untangle this. Mm -hmm. Sure. I, yeah. I wonder if you could do something. I mean, obviously, it wouldn't be foolproof, but just ask. You know, for about the, you know, for for, for hearing where you really want everybody here. If you could just say, you know, if there's an accessibility issue or another reason that you can't attend in person, um, we have an easy peasy waiver and just fill it out and and we're happy to put you online. And and that would weed out a bunch of them, you know? Well, and that's the where we have to think about what the standard practices are, right? Right. As long as Zoom is listed as a way to access via in the public hearing notice, anything like that, right. then that has to be just available to anybody. Right. Yep. If you want us to pair that back and only provide that link when people request it, whether it's board members or others, you know, we can do that as of right now is my understanding, but it's also a bit of an optics situation, I think, with the city at this point, because every single committee now has that option right. and some of them are completely remote um although the ones that are completely remote if uh act 78 expires like it's supposed to on january 15th they can't do that anymore um that has to be renewed by the governor mm -hmm. um or that completely remote public meeting option is out the window mm -hmm. and they have to at the minimum i think be hybrid where somebody is in person in a room mm -hmm. Which is one reason I was like, let's not do any like required changes to here when it comes to the remote meeting part yet, because I don't want to see, like you said, how it boils down. But yeah, it's going to be hard. It's, it's it, going to yeah. be hard. I mean, there's there's uh, there's a lot of people who really like zooming. Mm -hmm. You know, 
And it's uh, we had also cases when we were just going by Zoom here in New York that didn't have access to the internet. And so sure. what was their option? Yep. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think I don't yeah, I don't think it's something we can really put in our rules because it's always yeah. changing, but something clearly stating our preferences, you know, making that clear, I think is something we could do that's not binding. Uh, you know, is is really the way to do it because then you don't get in trouble for saying it's this way or that way. You just say, well, this is what we prefer. Right. How do we disseminate this to the public? Well, yeah. So that that is something where it comes down to the board basically asking us, tasking the department with having that be something that we just express to people and or put on the website, put where you know people are applying for zoning permits. Um, we could, if there is this sort of policy that you want to get out, um, we could just go through our, our communications director and make sure that that's disseminated sort of our basic announcement ways via the city website, Facebook, front porch forum, that type of stuff. Um, if you wanted the broader notice. I'm not sure that that really makes sense. Um, well, I mean, I think maybe like adding one sentence to like the general notice, like, you know, yeah, people, <laughs> people are people are encouraged to intend in person. However, there are these other options. Yeah, we so, could do that for yeah, the notice that gets mailed out to everybody and sure. the, the, the hearing notices, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I like that, saying that we prefer, because I do prefer coming in, having them here. For that. It, it seems like it really facilitates the whole process yeah, when you, it does make it easy. Yes. We just can't force them to do it yet because yeah. no, that's that's easy. That's easy to do is to change some of the text and like the footers and other places in our, our hearing notices. Yeah, we can start there and okay. let the legislature the tech, do. I mean the, the and the technology is going to continue to evolve. So you know and people are gonna get better with it. They're gonna get better with it. Uh, I mean, it'll be holograms. Be, you know, <laughs> Generally, it yeah. will be. Yeah. So around, yeah. One, one thing just on the technology. The technology. Go ahead, Sharon. Um, one thing on the technology, and if, if this is going to be kind of a continued thing, and it sounds like it really is, this is a horrible location. Oh, yeah, okay. yes. no, no, no. This, there's, there is a... <laughs> so I am not yes. part and parcel of this. Um there is a whole technology updating process that will hopefully be happening. Um, how that all boils down to, I'm not sure. My hope is we'll see large like TV screens in a few different places mm -hmm. throughout the room right? versus this crazy projector situation. Yeah, I mean, it's just the back and forth between people who are here and not here. It's just the Yeah, to, so that, you, you know, both the people in the audience and people in the round here have a screen that they can look to to see who's up there. Um, you know, it, it would be lovely if board members, you know, if we just had screens here on the tables yeah. built in right. that just logged yeah. into the Zoom and you could see that. Think that's going to be a little beyond the city's. Market. I mean, this this technology is you know circa 1978. Oh, I, I, I well maybe not that one, but almost. Oh, not that. <laughs> that. <laughs> Just yeah. yeah. No. That's what was that in there with clear slides. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, I, I I agree. Go ahead, Abby. I want to go back to this point about in person versus remote, and sure. I am uncomfortable stating a preference for having people present because I think Zoom is a game changer for accessibility mm -hmm. for for parents, for people that have tr transportation challenges, disabled, et cetera. Well Michael and I'm to... and I'm yeah. I feel as if putting a preference is just mm -hmm. uh, is biased. Okay. And I'm just uncomfortable with that i think we just have to find a way of like managing whatever risk or concern we see with people a lot of traffic over zoom yeah well one of the things you know when we have the bigger applications that's where it really starts to get complicated and i think you know the department is of the opinion that when we can try and have 
as many people as possible in person without overflowing the room, right? Um, so that, you know, we have talked to people you know, to say, hey, if you can, it really makes sense for you to be in person for this, especially with somebody who hasn't submit, submitted other testimony. Um, I, I see what you're saying. I mean, it I see be, what you're saying too. Because, I mean, we have had a lot of people who have said, thank you so much. This is letting me actually participate, participate sure. on, you know, at the most, at the most, you know, the quickest hearing possible versus, nope, I can't do that meeting because I don't have childcare. So I have to wait another two weeks. Well, does it still, does it still create a bias if you say, you know, if you can be here and if you can't come on Zoom, you know, I mean, like, I mean, just. Yeah, I don't I mean, know. I feel like it sends a wouldn't. subtle message that it's not exclusionary, but I feel like mm -hmm. it could send a message that you're less um, important if you're not in the room. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I, I don't really agree. I think you're like we might be worrying a little bit too much about hurting people's feelings. We're not stopping anybody from accessing this without being here. It's not a waiver that's easy to fill out. It's nothing, literally. It's just, it is easier if people are here. And with this kind of ambiguity of whether people should be on Zoom or come in, just saying we have a preference if you're here, but, or it's recommended you come here, however you word it so that it's not overly biased. I do think that we do have a preference to have people here and communicating that to the public isn't, isn't wrong and having the options, all these accessibility options we have, mostly Zoom, that's still available to everyone. We're not closing anyone off from that. We're not gonna be biased against people who are, but you know, if you have a little lady on Zoom and she, oh, you're muted, oh, this, that, you know, like it is kind of a pain in the butt to have people on Zoom sometimes. So I don't think there's anything wrong with, the, with requesting that if you can be here, please be here. You know, if I can be here, I come here. And when I can't, I don't. You know, I have a kid too. And sometimes I can't be here. And sometimes it's right at the last minute. I got to send Meredith an email. Hey, I'm going to be remote today. And that's easy enough to do. And it's not like we're going to be pushing back against these people if they do say that, right? It's just something in there that kind of when someone has either option totally available to them, it's like, oh, they want me to be there. So I'm going to go. As opposed to them saying, well, it's nice and warm in my house. It's cold outside. You know, I don't want to get out of my car and start it up. It's like, I'd rather they come here, you know, personally. Yeah. Yeah, I think especially when there's, in, in some minor cases where there might be 100 people that might come, you know. No. Those and cases, it, those cases. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll occur. Have, we'll, yeah. And it's, and it's, it's the next calendar. Well, it's like those. <laughs> yeah, uh, most sure. Like the entire structure of this board is like uh, structured around those minor cases because you know they many times were overkill, uh, and then we hit the you know application where there's uh, you know, the biggest development that people ever seen, and you know now every single aspect of the regulations is in play, and we need seven of us to you know really dig into it. So there's that, but we'll have. Uh, yeah, I think it's a good discussion. I, I I agree with you, Abby. I think that we don't want to give this idea of like a preference uh to like make people obligated to come i think on the other hand i would really like to figure out a way to just lean on the zoom platform the technology and like kind of like identifying it as this space of this opportunity for those that have those have those circumstances and really continue to recognize that and be thankful that they can participate um and uh but i don't think we have to set it in stone in any you know any policy but just have messaging about like you know, just be clear that like, oh, like, you know, it's like you can't get here in person, like, you know, it's like you're busy or whatever. It's like mm -hmm. this platform is for, you know, is 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 for you. Yeah. Okay. Uh so I'm not sure if any of you actually see the public notices that go out, the public hearing notices. Yep. So what I might be able to do is just tweak those a little bit. You know, the agendas, I think, would still look the same because on here, your, you know, in-person location and the Zoom option are all sort of the same font. They're, they're given the same weight. Wow. Um, the public hearing notices, maybe just the way they're presented visually, giving more weight to the Zoom option. 
So we could always adjust that a little bit without giving a preference to sort of give this as this is the alternative versus here are these two, here are these, here's where the meeting is, here's, because during COVID, it was like, no, 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 access it through the Zoom platform, yeah. making that really clear. Now they're equal weight and you're mm -hmm. just saying reduce the weight of one. Yeah, well, it's also the Zoom on the, the public hearing notices that get mailed to neighbors may actually more heavily weight Zoom. Yeah, that's so good. That, it may be just that, a presentation versus language situation. Mm -hmm. Maybe yeah. it's start for that's sure. A good start. Which will, you know, yeah. maybe achieve some of what you want without running into the implied preference that makes some people feel like they have to be in person, even when that makes it right. Hard. Or just like, and it's a preference with power and balance as yeah. well. Sure. Because we're a decision maker. Yeah. They're not. Yeah, it's an equity. Yeah. I guess I know that there's been some work done around uh, diversity and inclusion, like in the city, and uh, and then there's also organizations that work on flexibility. I'd be interested in what uh, guidance as to how we should yeah. address this. Whatever you guys want. To do. <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> let, let's go forward with the the small steps. Yeah. I can definitely make some tweaks to how some of the written notices are come across um, and then, yeah, I don't even know who's on those committees, but it might be it's a bigger picture question, right? For all the committees and boards as to how do we, if one has a preference for in-person, how do you then balance that with the accessibility and equity issues? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, my dad's on the Unitarian Church board and there, they had that same, um, thing where with Zoom, all kinds of people were just like, this is so great. I can actually get to church now. And they have, um, they're all excited to come back together, but there's still this really strong, like, yeah, you can access it this way. This is great. And we never want to lose this kind of thing. So there must be a way to, to do that. Well, you know? Yeah. Yep. There's wow. been cases too. Like I've seen some council meetings where this has been bombed. Like, I don't know, like Zoom bomb. Like oh. it's called. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of which, is there any public comment for this evening? <laughs> we have no I public. I see anyone no present. Public, 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 public comment. Um, I tuned into this tonight. Does anyone have any other items? I feel like we're wrapping up here and we've made some great progress. So thank you all for the discussion. So no further meetings this, this month. Not till not till the new year. Next year. Uh, oh. Yep. Yeah, next meeting um, will be January third. Um, yes. Sorry, I just got an application in today. Um, and um, there is no meeting January seventeenth. We just have the one January meeting. Um, so enjoy your holidays. Likewise. Thank, thank you. Yes. Thank you. you Mary. Make a move to adjourn. Oh, by chair and to adjourn. Second, second by Gene. And uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Oh, adjournment is passed, and we're adjourned. Aye. Aye.